Reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life, And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. join together in prayer. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which you spoke to people in the past, and we pray, Lord, that you will speak to us, and not only to us, but through us to this generation. Lord, we pray that uh, the people of this generation will rediscover what it means to be loved with an everlasting love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, my, my sister had a very difficult life. Um, she was divorced twice. Uh, her elder son died of a, uh, a drugs overdose. Uh, it was a very uh, sad life when I look back on it. it uh, uh, she died um, 15, 15 years ago. Uh, and yet, um, it all started off so different. You know, we, we were in the same family, we had the same advantages. Uh, on the opening page of her Bible are uh, a list of dates, the day she was saved, let's put that down, the date she was baptized, and then the date she was baptized with the Holy Ghost, which in the 
Pentecostal context that we, we attended uh, was the day she spoke in tongues. Um, but twice she was driven out of churches as a young teenager. Uh, the first, uh, well, I'm not going to go into detail, but it, was, it happened twice. It was uh, a very unloving attitude that really came from, from the pulpit, deliberately directed at her and some of her close friends, and I believe that both those pastors will have to give an account for the way in which they, they, uh, they behaved. Now, um, growing up in these Pentecostal churches, you know, I've got to say they were, they were great churches. I attended them uh, myself. They, they appeared to be the kind of church that uh, people would hanker after. You know, there was a speaking in tongues in every service. There was uh, a healings. Uh, there were prophecies, dreams were shared, and, and so on. The people were sincere and intense. Uh, I, they were a bit too intense. Sometimes uh, I remember one occasion there was a, a young lad came to the church, and uh, he was a near neighbor of, of ours, so I knew who he was. It was his first visit. And after the service, one of the men in the church pounced on him and wanted to get him to make a decision for Christ there and then. And, and the man told this young, youngster, it's today or never. Uh, and the young lad went quiet for what seemed a long time. It was probably only a minute or two. Uh, but he, he was given a serious thought and then he said, well, then I guess it's never. You know, and that was a very, very sad response, wasn't it? But it gives you some idea of the intensity uh, that was there. Um, I've told how I ended up leaving the Pentecostal churches, not because I fell out with anything that they were doing or anything that uh, uh, they believed. Um, I, you know, I was asked to leave the Sunday school, um, but, uh, you know, um, some of my uh, Pentecostal friends and, uh, you know, they, they couldn't understand how I could possibly leave a Pentecostal church and go into a Baptist one. Uh, but um, I, I got drawn into the work in that uh, Baptist church. I'm not a Baptist by, uh, by upbringing or anything like that, um, but I was drawn into this Baptist church because of what God was doing among young people. And uh, uh, we, we saw in that particular Baptist church the, the youth group go from 12 to 150 in three months. You know, you, that was intense, let me tell you. That was a real work of the Spirit of God, and yet there was no speaking in tongues, none of the, the things you would expect. Uh, but it, there was clearly a work of the Holy Spirit which changed lives. And even this week on Facebook, I, I've had um, contact from people that were there then to say that one of our group uh, passed away this week. Uh, and, um, you know, you think back to, to what it was like back in um, those days. A hundred teenagers baptized in one year. And the following year, parents of those teenagers being baptized. Uh, why were so many youngsters coming to know Christ in a Baptist church, you know, as I say, no speaking in tongues or healings. They, they didn't even sing choruses. Uh, they must have been the last Baptist church in the country to abandon the 1933 hymn book, you know. <clears throat> there was nothing lively about the services. I, I, I was preaching there some years ago, and uh, I looked at the order of service that they gave me and it was a typical hymn sandwich, and it only had four songs, four hymns. Uh, and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this, this service is never going to last an hour. And then they started singing the first hymn, and I thought, oh yes, it will. <laughs> you know, I mean. <clears throat> but why the growth in that particular church? You know, nothing spectacular happened there on the surface. But when the young people were giving their testimonies, 
maybe even while they were being baptized, or indeed their parents giving testimonies the year after, there seemed to be a common theme. And the theme was that people, young people, older people, felt an overwhelming sense of love and acceptance in that place. That is what struck them. A sense of being loved. Loved by God. And loved by God's people. Now if you are visiting or you've not been coming long, I I want to assure you that this is a great church. Because it is made up of people who love God, love each other, and love others. And that's why this is a great church. It disturbs me when uh, Christian people talk as if the secret of a church's success is due to power. You know, maybe, maybe a leader who is uh, uh, charismatic in some uh, form, you know, someone who stamps his authority on everything, uh, or with uh, signs and wonders, the miraculous, and so on. For it seems very clear to me from the Scriptures that the power which Jesus focused on was not the power to impress. It was the power to love. When the eternal Christ became the human Jesus, when divinity and humanity merged in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the results were, for some were very disappointing. The, the Jews were expecting a powerful Christ, a warrior Messiah, powerful enough to evict the Romans from the land, overflow or overthrow rather the uh, Edomites of Herod the Great and his dynasty, and restore the kingdom to Israel. Was Jesus able to do that? Well, Jesus was able to say at the moment of his arrest, when his disciples started to defend themselves, he said, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to, this is talking to Simon Peter, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than ten legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus had access to the power that he willingly laid aside. In fact, part of the Satan's plan was to get Jesus to exercise his supernatural power and reveal his deity. The temptations were designed so that Jesus would use his power to turn stone into bread, to throw himself down from the highest place in the temple so that the angels would appear to show people that he was the powerful Messiah. But the message of Jesus was not a message of power. It was a message of love. What is more important to Jesus, power or love? I'm glad you got it right. (laughs) But I get the distinct impression that Jesus was always very reluctant to use his power to impress the ordinary people. You know, when you read the stories of the miracles, you know, sometimes Jesus had to have his arm twisted to actually perform the the miracles. Um, Jesus knew full well that it didn't really have a lasting impact. I wonder how many people who sat down for the feeding of the 5,000 were among the crowd that shouted out, crucify him. If we are to to be true followers 
of Jesus Christ in today's society, we must get back to the business of being like Jesus. Does that mean performing miracles, walking on water, speaking in tongues? I don't suppose Jesus ever spoke in tongues, come to think of it. But we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can be like Jesus. There's a, an old hymn, you want, most of you under a certain age will not know this one, but it goes like this, Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. Why? That I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. The motivation of Jesus was not power and prestige, for those were the very things that he laid aside, the very things he emptied himself of when he became a human baby. This is what is meant when we read, he humbled himself. He laid aside power and prestige and clothed himself in sacrifice and service. And that is what we are also expected to do. This is a quotation from a, an old Christian hymn, uh, one that we don't have access to anymore other than in the writings of St. Paul. In your, mind, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. When God calls us to a particular ministry, whether it's pastor, preacher, trustee, core team leader, uh, head of ministry, youth leader, carrot group leader, whatever, do we do it in order to gain power and prestige within the church or within the wider society? If we do, then our mindset or attitude is not the same as that of Christ Jesus. When God graciously gives spiritual gifts to the church through us, you know, and that's the way that he does it. He gives gifts to the church through ordinary people like us, healings, administration, prophecy, or whatever, do we see this as a way to gain power or prestige within the church or within the wider community? If we do, then our mindset or attitude is not the same as that of Christ Jesus. For the impact of our ministry and gifting is not through power, but through love. In the short term, people may be impressed by power and prestige, but let me tell you, it never lasts. People don't like to think of other people being powerful. You know, uh, it's not long before the wows be become the uh, who does he think he is, you know? The banes of any uh, Christian minister's life are the flatterers and the hypocrites. And some people have the amazing ability to be both. Uh, do, you, do you know the difference between a, a flatterer and a, and a hypocrite? Uh, a flatterer is someone who will say to your face what they will not say behind your back. And a hypocrite is someone who will say behind your back what they will not say to your face. But when someone lives a life of sacrifice and service, it doesn't impress, it impacts. 
The Apostle Paul, having pointed people to the example of Jesus, gives a very practical lesson of sacrifice and service when he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. What will have the most impact? The assimilation of power and prestige, political maneuvering for positions within the church, or a life lived like Jesus, where power was not used for personal gain, but was used to benefit others, simply because he loved them as he loves us. The Bible makes it quite plain that we should have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus so that we may become blameless and pure. What a wonderful description. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of God of life. Jesus lived and died a life of sacrifice and service, empty of power and prestige, so that we could know that God loves us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit conspired together to love us. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, even God the Father, you can imagine what it took for the Father to hold back the hosts of heaven who would have rushed to the rescue of the eternal Christ from the sin and death which tore at his very soul because of us. But if that, at that moment the power and authority of Jesus was revealed to mankind, it would have taken away the sacrifice and the service motivated by pure love. What is it that we want our friends and our neighbors, our workmates and uh, uh, the people that we, we live among, what is it that we want them to see Power or love? Our position of prestige or our self-sacrifice as a result of love for them? What do we want them to see? Us being full of ourselves or would we rather them see Jesus. People need to see Jesus. Let's make sure that we help them to see him, to experience his love through us. Let's not hide Jesus by putting ourselves in the way. Let's join together in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your only begotten Son. We thank you, Lord, for loving us even though we did not deserve that love. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to take away the consequences of our own sin. Lord, we we thank you for the love that you have shown for us supremely on the cross. Lord, help us to live lives full of love, 
Help us to, to love those that are close to us. Help us to love those that are near to us. Help us to love those who are far away. Help us to, to love those we care for and help us to love for those that we don't even know. And we pray, Lord, that as we practice love within this church, that it will spread into the community all around us so that they will realize that this love is not normal, not natural, but it comes from you. Lord, you have changed our lives by revealing to us your love. Keep doing it, Lord, to our communities wherever we are. And help us, Lord, to practice that love on a daily basis. Thank you again, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, no. and we're going to... Uh...